And so the restrooms are there. You can feel free to have tea and water um, at any time during this meeting. And so, um, yeah, so now um, I just want to mention as well that this meeting is being recorded. So, and also I would like for you to silence your cell phones, if you may. And if you have to have a conversation, please take it outside of the meeting. Thank you. So, <clears throat> now that we've got a couple of ground rules down, we are going to start some, have some ground rules, some agreements uh, during this meeting. This meeting here tonight is for us to uh, come together as a community and have come up with some solutions. All right, can you all agree? Yeah. I see some head shaking. For those of you that don't know me know that I will physically, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, so if someone in the audience, just popcorn style, would read these agreements up here one at a time, please. All right, number two. Number three. <laughs> uh, that was for you. <laughs> and number four, please. So in this meeting, um, if everyone agrees with these agreements, I would just like for you all to do this, okay? This is a community meeting, and we will be talking, not yelling, not shouting, all right? And so with that said, we have a meeting. There was something else that I wanted to say about these. Um, we are gonna hold all of our questions to the end um, of the conversation you will have a chance to ask questions but please write those questions down so that you can answer them at the appropriate time all right so now I'm gonna have Emily Alma thank you Keisha I want to mention a couple of other things before I get started. One is that we are being televised. I want you to know that. So um, BCAC TV is televising us live. So that's exciting for us that, that this will have a lot of um, folks able to watch. And also, if you don't want to be televised, you can hide in the corner, OK? <laughs> <laughs> but we're really pleased that they're willing to do this. Uh, there are several of our elected folks here, and um, I'm not going to mention names because I'm afraid I might miss somebody, but I do want to welcome Chief Mike O'Brien um, to be here, uh, and we want this to be a conversation where we are seeking solutions, not attacking people. And um, I also understand that D.A. Ramsey will be here, and he was held up in court, so he's, he's going to be slipping in a little bit late. But welcome, everyone. I'm really glad you're here, and we've been working toward this for um, quite a few months, and we're excited to have this be our first maiden voyage um, to open up, the Concerned Citizens for Justice, to open up to the public. Um, our tagline is building a culture of trust and respect for the work we are doing as Concerned Citizens for Justice because we feel this is the essence of what we are about. Am I too close to the mic? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not a professional. <laughs> um, so, um, our ultimate goal is to establish citizen oversight of local law enforcement, and we see that as being connected with building a culture of trust and respect in our community. That's the way we see a process that will achieve that end. 
after we have met for over a year, um, and tonight you'll be we'll be sharing with you the um, results of some of that work. Uh, we have already presented to the um, Human Relations Network and to the Chico City Council, and we met. Several of us sat down with um, Chico Police Chief Mike O'Brien, and we are pleased that Chief O'Brien was receptive to our thoughts. So we are looking forward to this being a positive evolution of what's happening in our community. Chief O'Brien shared with us that our intention is in accord with the mission and value statement of the Chico Police Department. That, that mission or that vision being to build a culture of trust and respect. Their mission is to create a safer Chico and improve quality of life by partnering with our community and providing dedicated service. Their values, integrity, courage, respect. So in principle, the vision of Concerned Citizens for Justice and the mission of the Chico Police Department are in alignment and that seems like a great place to begin this endeavor. The members of Concerned Citizens for Justice, we refer to ourselves as CC4J, came together after the shooting death of Desmond Phillips at the hands of Chico police officers on May 17, 2017. Oh, what did I say? <laughs> March, March 17th, I'm so sorry, I've known that deeply. Um, and we came together with a sense, uh, a shared sense that we must do something that was not right, this, this death. Soon after we began to meet, in July, came the shooting death of Tyler Rushing. We also had been disturbed by previous excessive use of force incidents that did not become lethal but were still disturbing, such as the highly publicized incident on August 30th, 2016, when a 19-year-old college woman was taken to the ground by a Chico police officer. It, this was an interaction that began over a blown out license plate light. So we recognize and appreciate that Chico PD has made several changes in practice and training since those incidents. Plus, over the years, there have been many entirely respectful interactions between law enforcement and the police. Yet, we feel that tactics of intimidation are too often employed and that it is essential for our community to adopt a process of independent, transparent citizen oversight to assure long-term change. We are in step with the times. In response to Black Lives Matter and publicity around the shooting deaths of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, and so many, many others, citizen oversight groups are springing up all over the country, from Albany, New York, to Fort Collins, Colorado, to San Diego, California. And at the federal level, with the creation of the Task Force on 21st Century Policing, this is a movement and we're part of it. We're right in time. Our intention for this evening is to introduce the concepts and vision of citizen oversight and building this, transforming this culture, um, introduce this to the greater community and invite you to help us bring it about. We are aware that those charged with carrying out the tasks of law enforcement often face dangerous and challenging situations. Yet we are convinced that deep cultural changes will protect officers of the law as well as the communities they serve. We are not experts in this work, but we are learning as we go. During the first part of this evening, we will provide several brief presentations including a couple of videos, to give you background on this effort to establish citizen oversight. Following that will be an opportunity to hear from all of you, to have the community conversation that we promised. Next up, we have Jill Bailey and Diane Suzuki to introduce the fo focus points that our group developed. 
identifying the product, the priorities for our work. And that's on the, the sheet of paper that was handed out to you. We feel that this summarizes our priorities, although it's, there's much more that we need to deal with than what are on there, but that's a, a really good start. Okay, thank you, Jill and Diane. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So thank you, Emily. We wanted to, to start out tonight by presenting to you our six focus points. It's been our work for the last year. We've done a lot of discussing and um, contemplating, but we kind of look back to these focus points as our six points of focus where we want to focus all of our efforts. And we believe that these changes that we're gonna present have the potential to save many lives in our community. There is hard work ahead of us to change the culture of law enforcement. Our vision for our community starts with de-escalation becoming normal practice. The goal of policing in response to crisis situations should be de-escalation. This means officers take the time to evaluate and respond appropriately to an individual's erratic actions, whether these are due to health challenges, trauma, or any other reason. We expect law enforcement to make every effort to prevent injury even in cha challenging situations. Giving our police the tools to do this requires ongoing education and training. Training in behavioral health crisis intervention and avoidance of implicit bias is essential. Comprehensive training in behavioral health crisis de-escalation will allow police officers and other first responders, including 911 dispatchers, to respond appropriately to individuals in crisis. Such training should foster a culture of collaboration between the police, mental health professionals, social services, and or family members with the goal of a more peaceful resolution of each crisis. It's essential that 911 dispatchers send the appropriate resources to every call. And because, because bias against certain groups is inherent in our culture and influences even people who aren't aware of it, all first, responder, for all first responders and law enforcement staff must receive comprehensive diversity, implicit bias training. Local police must ensure that incidents of disparate treatment are addressed so that all community members are treated with the same level of dignity and respect. Expanding community-oriented policing. Community-oriented policing is a proactive approach to public safety in which police work closely with all sectors of our community. Collaboration is the foundation of community policing. Mutual non-combative communication between police and all people living in our community will create relationships based on respect in which police and citizens identify and solve community problems as partners. Demilitarizing of local police. Police work depends on trust and respect. When police officers are armed like combat troops, they diminish relationships and, and intimidate citizens. Law enforcement may underestimate the impact of militarized images of themselves. Before the police accept military equipment from any agency, they must first receive authorization from local elected officials, such as the city council or the board of supervisors. The matter must also be open to the public for comment. A less threatening image will help foster positive interactions between law enforcement and the community and will result in increased public safety. First and foremost, we would like our police officers to serve as guardians rather than warriors. Support and care for our officers. Our police are essential. We know that police work can be both dangerous and stressful, and that first responders have higher levels of post-traumatic stress than the general public. 
Therefore, full mental health support must be available for officers and first responders whenever needed and encouraged following any crisis situation. Counseling must be mandatory following the discharge of a weapon or any use of force incident to ensure the mental health of the officer and the safety of the public. Law enforcement personnel involved in use of force incidents must live with the consequences of their actions. Thus, addressing such situations with adequate therapeutic intervention is imperative. Citizen oversight of law enforcement. Improvement of our police department requires citizen oversight. An independent, impartial citizen board with the authority to review all police files is essential. As in other cities, this board will review every incident of police use of force. In addition, they will hear citizen complaints, recommend disciplinary action when necessary, and assess and recommend improvements to police policy. The board will operate transparently and issue its findings publicly. Its members will reflect the diversity of our community. Members of the board may be appointed by elected officials or elected directly by the voters. So we believe that these changes will create a culture within the police department that values the dignity of all citizens and works to preserve human life. And those are our focus points. We have, at this point, two videos that we want to show. Um, they're both about 10 minutes in length, and they kind of show what's happening around the country, some um, approaches to policing and de-escalation and mental health treatment that we thought were um, very helpful in understanding our concerns tonight. So I'm going to try and play those now. With so many questionable police shootings caught on camera during the past two years, how police are trained is coming under greater scrutiny, along with calls for reform. Studies by the Washington Post and The Guardian found police in this country shot and killed about a thousand people last year, almost three people a day. The Post found 987 cases and The Guardian 1,014. The country's 18,000 police departments on average train officers for only a total of 15 weeks before rookies hit the streets. Maria Haberfeld, a professor of police science at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York blames poor police training, not rogue cops, for many questionable cases of lethal force. There are police officers who do not belong on the, on the job who are trigger happy, but this is not the overwhelming majority, to the contrary. This is a fraction of a fraction, but the overwhelming majority are poorly trained. For police departments around the country, guidelines on the use of lethal force are based on Supreme Court rulings that justify it when officers feel that they or others are in imminent danger. But there are no national standards. And in the wake of so many notorious police shootings, some departments, like the one here in Columbus, are reinforcing the idea that deadly force should be a matter of last resort. So he has a knife. At the police academy here, veterans and rookies alike are studying videos of police-involved shootings. What else could have been done? Could this life have been saved? How would you do it yourself? Is there a better way? Police Chief Kim Jacobs, a 36-year veteran of the Columbus Police Department, became chief in 2012. After the 2014 Ferguson, Missouri police shooting of Michael Brown, who was unarmed, Jacobs ordered new lethal force training in Columbus. Community meetings had convinced her that a change was needed. Why do people fear us? I mean, I heard that in our community meetings. People fear the police. That's absurd to me because we're the good people, and yet people are afraid of how we're going to react. And that is understandable, Chief Jacobs says, when people see videos like this 2014 recording of a police dashboard camera in South Carolina. The incident began when state trooper Sean Grubert pulled over driver LeVar Jones for not wearing a seatbelt. Grubert asked Jones for his driver's license. Can I see your license, please? Yeah, go! Yeah. When Jones reached inside his car, Grubert 
opened fire. Did that seem like a threat to you? I, I had no reason to think that there was a threat at that point in time. When I think about when I would justify myself pulling the trigger, I want to be certain that I am in imminent danger and there's some way that that could happen. Jones survived. Gruber was fired and charged with aggravated assault. What could the cop do differently? In Columbus, such videos are case studies in how not to handle potentially combustible moments. Chief Jacobs says a rush to use of lethal force is a common mistake and one that contributed to one of Ohio's most infamous police shootings, the death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland in 2014. Rice had been holding a toy gun in a park when police responding to a 911 call drove within a few feet of Rice and seconds later opened fire. What alternative did those officers have? What could they have done better? not gotten that close. They could either get out on foot and approach him and, you know, giving him orders, let me see your hands, all that kind of thing. Um, they could have tried to find out either via intercom or something else what this person's intentions were. In Philadelphia, a spike in police shootings three years ago led then Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey, who retired earlier this month, to ask the U.S. Justice Department for help. I wanted to take a look at our training I wanted to look at our policy to make sure we're doing everything we can to minimize the number of, of times that an officer would actually have to resort to the use of deadly force. Turn around slowly. Keep the Justice Department offered more than 90 recommendations, including increased reality-based training, which emphasizes strategies that give police more time and distance from suspects in high-risk encounters. All right. You have to call for backup right away. Such tactics include calling for backup, finding cover or moving away from a dangerous suspect, engaging the suspect in conversation. Slow the momentum, remember that word? Slow it down. Since adopting the recommendations, the Philadelphia Police Department's fatal shootings are down. In 2013, police shot and killed 11 people. That fell to four in 2014 and only two last year. We have to train to make sure that our officers only use the force necessary under the most extreme circumstances, that being deadly force, period. Doesn't matter who the offender is. But training in deadly force tactics is strictly up to individual police departments. Maria Haberfeld argues that needs to change. To me, it's mandatory to identify minimal standards for each and every police department in the country with regard to use of force, and not just the length of training, but also the content. Because it's one thing to, to train police officers how to use a gun, but it's another to train police officers what kind of factors go into using uh, deadly force. Haberfeld and other criminologists say police departments also need to incorporate more training on race. In Columbus, black people make up 28 percent of the city's population, but only 12 percent of the police force. Sergeant James Fuqua says having more officers who reflect the neighborhoods they patrol could help reduce misperceptions and violent exchanges. I'm not calling anybody a racist or it's racially motivated. I just think sometimes there's a misunderstanding uh, with cultural differences. Did you get hassled because you were a young black man? Absolutely, absolutely. Just because of the color of my skin and the neighborhood in which I lived many of times, I, I was, for lack of better words, harassed. When I got older, I realized that they weren't bad people and they were just doing their job. And then once I became an officer, I realized that, you know, they were trying to do their job. But at the end of the day, they kind of did a poor job with the community policing aspect of it. Former federal prosecutor Sharon Davies believes police training should also focus on unintended or implicit racial bias. Davis heads the Kerwin Institute on Race at Ohio State University and is a consultant to the Columbus Police. If those associations are negative, such as presumptions of uh, violence or threat or criminality, that can make a police officer see a threat where there is no threat. What do you see as potential solutions? I mean, do we need changes in state law or do we need 
much better police training. There's absolutely no, no question that all police forces should be trained about the reality of unconscious racial biases that affect all of us. That's a reality that all of us need to take very seriously, and, uh, and police officers especially. Not even the most advanced training can eliminate lethal force, and police are legally justified to use it in order to save lives, including their own. In fact, the Washington Post study found that in three quarters of the fatal shootings, police were under attack or defending someone who was. In Philadelphia and Columbus, police are convinced better training can give officers better options than shooting to kill. You don't grow up being taught how to deal with the police. The police are taught how to deal with our citizens. And so it's our responsibility. So we have one more video to show, and the next video focuses on the Memphis model. And I just want to remind everyone to write down questions or comments that you may have, because later on in the program we will have a guided conversation that we're hopeful that you have input for us. Attributed to many Americans with mental illnesses ending up in jails. To address that, the city of Memphis pioneered police training techniques to help people with mental illness avoid getting arrested. One thing the Memphis police are taught is that the mentally ill are actually more likely to be victims of violent crimes than perpetrators. In tonight's signature segment, the NewsHour's Megan Thompson looks at a policing approach that's become a national model. Police officer Christopher Ross patrols a precinct on the south side of Memphis an area with a very high rate of crime. Ross sees a lot of violence, drug use, and prostitution. Seven, eight, three. Um, but those aren't the only types of calls that Ross responds to. Mother's involved with her son, and uh, he's, he's diagnosed with ADHD and uh, mood disorder. And uh, she said he's been taking his meds, but right now he's being unruly. So we're gonna go and see uh, what we can do to help. Ross is part of the Memphis Police Department's Crisis Intervention Team, or CIT. What's going on? Officers specially trained to handle people with mental illness. Here, Ross finds a teenage boy in crisis. His mom says he's being bullied at school. See, everybody at that school knows that you're smart, that you got something going for yourself, and what they're trying to do is to stop you from being all that you can be. Ross is trained to de-escalate situations using mostly verbal techniques to keep both officers and citizens safe and keep people with mental health issues out of jail. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you my number. So when you're having a problem, call me, okay? If you're feeling sad, you feeling depressed, call me. And we, you can tell me whatever you want to tell me. I don't care what it is. Handshake on it. After 20 minutes, the teen is calm and agrees to go back inside. Memphis started its CIT program 27 years ago, after the police shot and killed a man with mental illness who charged at them with a knife. The city formed a task force, including the Memphis Police Department and the National Alliance on Mental Illness. At the time, University of Memphis psychiatry professor Randy DuPont was directing the city's main psychiatric emergency service. He helped develop the CIT program. In an event that's going to escalate and become a crisis, it's going to be those first few minutes that are pretty critical. So what they thought about when they came up with this concept was, why don't we take some of that expertise, let's identify those officers that want to do this, that, are, that could be good at it, give them some, the best training we can find, and then let's look and see what kind of differences that makes. Hey, how you doing? You want to call? That training starts with changing officers' attitudes and perceptions. <coughs> DuPont says, People in crisis often act out of fear and may not understand what's happening around them. An untrained officer could interpret such behavior as defiance or non-compliance. Officers are often trained in the academy to see non-compliance and, re and respond with greater use of force. That's part of their training. Uh, but in CIT, what we're trying to say to the officers is, let's analyze the non-compliance, let's look strategically at it. So we're looking for that different interpretation of behavior. First of all, 
we, we have to talk about having compassion. Major Vincent Beasley is in charge of the Memphis CIT program. He patrolled the streets as a CIT officer for eight years. Are all officers cut out to do this kind of work? I don't think so. I really think it takes a special person to do that. Not everybody's cut out for that because you have to have patience and you, and, and you have to really care about people and you have to understand that it's not the individual himself. It's something that's going on. It's something, you know, in his, in his brain that's not working properly. It's a chemical imbalance. CIT is having a measurable impact. Major Beasley says of the 14,911 calls last year that CIT officers responded to, only 19 encounters resulted in injuries to a person with mental illness. And the vast majority ended without a person being detained. Around 4,400 were taken to mental health treatment facilities, and just over 600 were taken to jail. So we're not taking nearly as many people uh, to penal facilities that are, that are suffering from mental illnesses because we realize they don't need to be there in most cases. Those with mental illness who do get arrested wind up here at the Shelby County Jail where there's a special wing with 46 cells for people with mental illness. Hundreds more inmates on psychiatric medication are housed in the jail's general population, where many are also offered psychiatric treatment and group therapy for things like addiction and anger management. Uh, what else would you all do when he, when he throws up this, uh, how are you going to help me? Joining the police department's crisis intervention team is voluntary, and officers and dispatchers must attend 40 hours of training. There were three days of intensive role playing based on real situations officers have faced in the field. John, I see that you're very upset and, yeah, and I want to help you. Nobody cares about me and with me out of job, man, I just, it's never for me to be here for. I want to say from the standpoint, like you said, dealing with handled by CIT. The trainees, dressed here in plain clothes, also spent a day meeting people with mental illness. I'm at a point now where I can go back to independent living. I, I still must take my medication. They learn about what it's like to live with their conditions and about their experiences with the police. They came to my house, sheriff's department came to my house and kicked my door in. Well, he told me to shut my freaking mouth. Could you have a paramedic make a scene over here? Today, there are 274 active CIT officers like Chris Ross on the Memphis force of almost 2,100, or about one of every eight officers. The CIT program is operated within the department's existing budgets. Officers wear these pins to identify themselves. Ross, who's been CIT for three years, never answers a call without backup. When he's flagged down by a man who says he's a Vietnam veteran and has bipolar disorder, Ross pulls over to talk. He uses simple strategies, introducing himself and being calm. I'm Officer Ross. Just call no, me. You okay? Bro. Well, call me Chris, okay? Ross says a huge part of his job is simply listening and keeping tabs on people he knows might need help. And, and talk to well, me. That's I what I'm here blow, for. Man. Don't explode. You want to know why you ain't got to explode? Yeah, no. I'm talking to you. Because you're talking to me. Let me see this. Here, he checks up on a man he's gotten to know. Third eye, you in here? The man lives in an abandoned motel. You sleep? Come and holler at me. I just want to talk to you, make sure you're doing all right. I got all CNIs, man. I'm a, I'm a Power Ranger and a superhero. You really, you really on my side. I'm on your side. So you understand it. You always try to get them comfortable and let them know I'm here to help. And whatever they say, you listen to it, you repeat it to them so they'll know that you're listening to them. And eventually you'll uh, establish a relationship and they'll feel more or less like you're there to help them versus trying to lock them up. If Memphis police determine people might pose a danger to themselves or others, an officer can take them to the Crisis Assessment Center for evaluation and medication. Many of the services here are free. It's inside the Memphis Mental Health Institute, so if they need long-term inpatient care, patients don't have to go far. After they leave, there's also a new outpatient program for continuing psychiatric care. Officials say it's reduced the number of repeat visits to both the Crisis Center and the Institute. Mark Havener has been a patient at the Memphis Mental Health Institute. He has bipolar disorder and began having psychotic episodes 17 years ago, locking himself in a closet for hours at a time and attempting to kill himself. Do you have any idea how many times you've tried to end your life? Lost count at about 25. 25. And I lost count at my hospitalizations. Again, about, I got tired of counting at 25. During one psychotic episode in 2002, 
Havner started to strangle his wife. I grabbed her by the throat and I got up and I shoved her up against the, uh, the inside of the front door of the house. After he let her go, she called 911 and CIT officers responded. By this time, I'm pretty much nonverbal. I can't express what's going on because it, it's, it's a hurricane inside of me, a maelstrom. They don't even handcuff me because they, they see what kind of condition I'm in. Treating me as a human being in crisis and not a uh, potential perpetrator. Havner was hospitalized and never faced criminal charges. He got treatment and today he is stable, has reconciled with his wife and works as a counselor to others with mental illness. He's also become an advocate, sharing his story with the CIT trainees. And that officer crouched down to my eye level. And he looked me in the eye and he recognized me as a person. The strategies developed in Memphis are now called the Memphis Model and have been adopted by almost 3,000 of the nation's 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Studies have shown that CIT trained officers are less likely to arrest people with mental illness than non-trained officers. For Chris Ross, that's one of the things he likes most about this job, the potential to help people rather than put them in jail. That's why I work, that's why I do it, to make a difference because if we get to the point where we're making a difference, we won't have to lock so many people up. Turn on, see the Forgot to turn this back on. Oh, it's fast. So, a lot of inf inspiration up here. And I saw lots of people writing down comments and questions, so I'm looking forward to that part of our program. We just wanted to provide an introduction to some of the alternatives to violence for our police department. Next, we have Margaret, who's going to look at what is citizen oversight. And I'm going to need a little bit of light. I have about 10 minutes I want to share with you about uh, citizen oversight. So what do we mean when we say citizen oversight? Exactly what is citizen oversight of law enforcement? Based on the National Association for Civilian oversight of law enforcement, and their acronym is NACOL. In its simplest form, it is one or more individuals outside the sworn chain of command of a police department who hold that department and its officers accountable for their actions. Contrasted with internal affairs, which is within the police department and hidden from public view, citizen oversight lets citizens hold the police accountable for the use of force, police policies, and transparency. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Of course, all law enforcement is subject to the control and direction of citizens through our elected representatives. This is the essence of policing in a democratic society. How involved elected officials are in the operation of law enforcement varies region by region, of course. How involved are our elected officials in our police agencies? How do they respond to police use of force? Think of the many incidents you know about in our region and tell me how our elected officials responded. Who is holding our police accountable? Actually, actually, we don't really know, do we? Oversight agencies become both an independent source for and a repository of both qualitative and quantitative data. 
They issue reports on the number, type, outcome of misconduct in investigations, lawsuits, use of force, detention, and arrest. We don't have that data for Chico or Butte County at this point, but an oversight group would have it. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement's primary goals is to provide help in establishing civilian oversight of law enforcement and to educate the public. It was established in 1995 and it is the largest civilian oversight organization in the United States. The first oversight in California was in Berkeley, established in 1973, the Police Review Commission, and they were granted the independent authority to investigate complaints. Attempts to establish oversight are sometimes hampered by police unions and or the indifference of our elected officials. The crime card or selling fear to the community is often what prevents support for oversight and blocks transparency. As we know, fear sells. But while some police unions oppose oversight, other police groups such as Pamela Seifert, Sacramento Police Department, writing in the Police Chief Magazine, says that prof professional civilian oversight of law enforcement agencies can transform organizational police culture in a very positive way. The police captain says that civilian oversight is exactly what is needed for the police to regain legitimacy, boost their morale, increase the hiring of diverse candidates, and improve our public safety. But, thank you. But policing, you know that clapping came from the people who've been working on this for a year with me. <laughs> but policing is changing for many reasons, including the internet, smartphones, 24 seven news cycle, and the media culture that creates a narrative of its own. In the Department of Justice investigation in the Baltimore Police Department, it was revealed that the department was shielded almost entirely from public view and that the inadequate oversight mechanisms damaged the department's legitimacy in the community. Yet, while we talk about police account accountability, please don't forget that out of thousands and actually out of most, daily police citizen interactions, only a very few result in the use of force or injury. Professional civilian oversight can hold the media responsible for their exaggeration and it can push back against the narrative that police violence occurs often. It doesn't, not in most towns, but if it does occur, it must be open to citizen scrutiny. There is no one size fits all approach to police oversight. There are more than 200 oversight, oversight entities in the United States. No two are alike. There are civilian review boards, monitors, auditors, inspector generals, mediators, all seeking to resolve citizen complaints. The best approach is open to debate. Many factors will influence the best choice for our city and our county. But each civilian oversight board must be educated in police work, knowledgeable about equipment capabilities, police procedures, and the law. Because civilian oversight is such a huge issue, one of the tasks we must, must do is track legislation. We know of one bill 
that has the potential to really change how the police use force. It is Assembly Bill 931. It is currently in the Public Safety Committee and it returns to the floor on June 19th tomorrow. It is asking for a common sense standard, a common sense change in language that recognizes the value of preserving human life. It is a one word change in the law. Police would be prohibited from using deadly force unless necessary. The law currently says that the police may use deadly force whenever reasonable. This is a, pro a profound and enormous change that will require police to use de-escalation techniques to defuse a situation. De-escalation is one of the top priorities of concerned citizens for justice. And SB 1421 is currently in the assembly and it seeks to make law enforcement records about officer use of force or sexual assault available to the public and to hiring agencies. Now those records are completely hidden from public view that must change. The public is not safe unless we have this information. Some of the words to describe oversight are Police Review Commission, Office of the Ombudsman, Police Review Authority, Police Review Board, Police Internal Investigations, Auditing Committee, Citizen, Office of Citizen Complaints, and the list goes on and on. Some board members are trained mediators, some are attorneys, some are professionals in social sciences. Some oversight groups hear complaints. Some limit, it, limit the type of complaint to use of force incidents. Some examine police policy. Some have open hearings. Some have subpoena powers. But what are the limitations of citizen oversight? It cannot ensure police accountability. Citizen oversight depends on the talent, the fairness, and personalities of the individuals involved. It has limited authority. It does not impose discipline on officers or dictate department policy, though it may make recommendations on policy and discipline depending on their charter. To create citizen oversight in Chico or Butte County will require that we study what oversight is best and needed in our region. We would need to define our goals for oversight to begin. The dis discussion must include collaboration with the public, the police, police labor, key public officials, grassroots community organizations, academia, all interested citizens. It will take a coalition of community members to make oversight a reality for us. It will take partnerships, police and civilian alike, to create citizen oversight and make it work for us. It will take ongoing collaboration to make it effective. Concerned citizens for justice believe that we have taken the first steps in this process. And should citizen oversight be established at the ballot box by a vote of all citizens or created in the city charter? We have choices. We will have to decide on what model to establish what duties, power, and authority this group will exercise, and how will it be funded? Who will staff the oversight group? Volunteers or paid employees? How, we, how will we build relationships with key stakeholders, with law enforcement, with local government, with police unions, and with the public? 
particularly in this age of rancor and tribal politics. How will we do it? The effectiveness of oversight in any community is dependent on so many factors, including political will and budgetary support, ready access to information such as police files, records, performance data, police training. We do know that the most important thing we must do is listen to our community, be fully inclusive, and work together to develop the best oversight model for us. We are taking the first steps, and we need the next steps to be fully collaborative. We need to take the next steps with all of you. The movement for oversight is considered largely one, but now the challenges are developing it and spreading it throughout cities and counties. Standards for oversight and performance me measures must be in place, place. Oversight is transforming the landscape of policing, and it is requiring closed, non-transparent police departments to realize that citizen-run oversight is beneficial to the police department and the community. Ultimately, it is protective for police, our community. Ultimately, it is protective for each of us. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. How y'all feeling? Check in, check in. How y'all feeling? I know it's uh, a little overwhelming. Don't let your emotions get involved. All right, so just all of, all of that you've seen and heard here tonight, just remember that we're here to close the gap and build a bridge between the community and law enforcement and others that are involved in helping to make this happen. And so now is going to be uh, this part of the event called a community conversation. So all those questions that you have written down, please be mindful of one another um, as they're asking their questions and please remain respectful. As I stated earlier, a lot of you do not know me. Some of you do, but I will ask you to leave if I feel like you are, um, you know, getting out of hand or being disrespectful in any manner because this is a community conversation and this is, we're trying to close that gap and build the bridge between us, the community, and our law enforcement. We're here to be the solution to the problem, not be the problem. All right? Thank you. Well, thanks everybody, thank you. Uh, where'd she go, Margaret? Margaret, you're just so fantastic, you're great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody from cc for j you know what, you look back, we've been together uh, probably over a year just putting all this together and it seemed like he wasn't getting anywhere and I sit here, I was just about to cry. I was like, wow, we really made a lot of headway. So we thank you guys for coming out, for being concerned citizens as well. And again, elected officials, those who are in authority, shout out to you guys. So now we're gonna have our community conversation. So w was this a good meeting or what? So far, so good? Well, let's just keep it good. This is community conversation time, so if you guys have any questions, comments, are we gonna pass the other mic around yeah. as well? So this is that time to ask questions. We don't have all the answers. Again, we're grassroots, but we're building a coalition. We're, we're building this oversight, the cc for j so hopefully you guys in the audience uh, will be a part of this to help build this and put it together. So who wants to, who has any questions? Who, you only have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so Keisha Question. will take the mic. Okay, we had questions. Get my exercise today. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Munzer, and I am from, well, the homeless community. How are you guys doing? Good. Chief, it sounds like we're taking a step backwards to good old-fashioned policing. The old-fashioned type that you stop, you talk. You find out what's going on. 
And that's what it really sounds like we need to do. We need to de-escalate and just take a step backwards. And having the, the privilege of growing up up north, Washington, Oregon, California, one of these days we got to talk about newspapers. But anyway, they stopped in Lakeview. They stopped in Chihuahua. They stopped in Yakima. And, you know, that's what it sounds like we're going to do. And I really hope we can get there. The next question I ask is, how do we get the mental health into the training academy? That's where it's going to count the most. When we get that education grassroots right down there. That's the question. Would you like to respond first? Hi, Ken. Thank you very much. Um, so there is uh, mental health crisis training in the academy. That's really the beginning of all police officer training. But then, in addition, and just so you know, California officers are the best trained officers in this country. Um, most things um, that are developed, good things that are developed as far as training, usually come out of uh, California. So it first starts in the, uh, the academy, and then departments have required training for our field training officers. And then other departments will do additional things to add to that already required training. So every police department in California is under the mandate of the peace officer standards and training. And that's really the, the entity that establishes our training guidelines. And then each individual, individual department in California then develops their own um, additional training core. So for us, um, we brought in an expert. Um, Dr. Carol McKinley Alvarez. I can provide that information to the uh, concerned citizens for justice. We have brought her in twice to train not just a select few of our police officers, but every one of our police officers to include every one of our dispatchers, to include every one of our personnel that has any contact with the public. That includes records clerks, um, our, our community service officers. Everyone in the department has gone through that twice. Um, she is outstanding. I will uh, ask everyone to go ahead and Google her, and if you find something on YouTube, she is outstanding. I know we also brought in members of the public to attend that training. Is anyone here that attended that training? Anyone in the show of hands? Thank you for the training. She was actually very good. She was. She was, uh, she was outstanding. The other uh, key piece, not only uh, um, for um, training those officers with uh, CAT and what have you, but we went in, again an additional step, just so you guys know. We sent a cadre of officers to train the trainer training regarding CIT so they could come back and actually really actually good. train the rest of the police department. Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, well, I have one from this gentleman right here. Uh, state your name, sir. Trey Robinson. Uh, thanks to all who, in, who are involved with this effort. Um, will you all discuss um, what's next in regards to everything that you presented? What's next? <coughs> Everybody's looking at Emily. <laughs> well, 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 what's next? What's, what's next? You guys need to sign up. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, it's it's kind of an open book. This is this is the beginning of chapter two of Concerned Citizens for Justice. And uh, we don't have a plan other than hoping we don't have to lick our wounds after tonight. <laughs> uh, and it seems so far that we won't. And, and uh, moving forward in whatever way it seems appropriate, one thing that occurs to me is that some of us need to sit down with the police, the Chico Police Union and talk to the, the guys on the street, the folks on the street. But there's, there's many places to go, and we'd like to hear from you because we don't want to do this by ourselves anymore. <laughs> Amen. Amen. OK, anyway, anybody else? So my question is, I, I just um, finished the CIT um, Memphis model training in Woodland. I also speak to speak at it for the past year and a half. They've trained 54,000 officers in Tehama, Placerville, Yolo, and just got 900 officer contract in Sacramento. And so I think this is a good starting point for this. I think that the mental health part is critical 
and the services part out on the street of outreach is critical because if we don't have that and we don't get to the core of the individuals, then we're not gonna have anything. So I've been numerous times with great officers, um, awesome officers, and I've been um, stopped on the side of the street when four of them are surrounding someone and not so fabulous officers. So that's just like with anything. I mean, there are jerk people in my block and there are jerk people in your block, right? So we just have to all come together. So through NAMI, um, I'm also a board member of National Alliance Mental Illness Butte County and founder of Crisis Care Advocacy and Triage. And what we wanna do is we wanna bring the Memphis model to Butte County and we wanna train um, 50 advocates. But we wanna train them with not a diversion from the police. We want them trained exactly as the police because I am so tired of running into people and going like this you know, batting heads, batting heads. We need to be in union and our advocates out there, um, every one of us, there's a lot of us out there every single day, need to be on the same page with the police and what the officers are being trained as so that way we can better understand um, what they're up against. Thank you, Lisa. Well said. I got one right here. What your name is? My name's Arnicio Kello. I've worked with teachers for many years at Chico State and it took us quite a bit of time to train teachers how to deal with students. And it, I'm just wondering uh, how much time is really spent with uh, uh, what the psychologist or whatever it was to work with these people. And we worked with those students over a full year. Some didn't make it. And some did, as I'm sure would happen with police. But I want to know how much real time is being spent. Is that for Mr. O'Brien? I guess that's for you. Thank you. Um, so just, and, th and this probably would be a good uh, opportunity to, to maybe schedule something in the future where we really provide every aspect of uh, your police department in a, uh, a contextual uh, format so you understand more than just me talking for two minutes. I think that's really probably not uh, ideal. I don't think it's fair to you. I don't think it's uh, fair to the, the process, um, but I'll do my best to answer your question, ma'am. So a police officer attends about a, uh, a five-month, six-month academy that has aspects of this um, throughout their training. And then after that, Academy training, the real training really begins, and that's what's called field training. And that's where that police officer, that police trainee, for essentially another five months, maybe longer, depending on their, uh, their uh, development, will have an experienced field training officer sitting next to them in a car every single minute for five months. Everything that police officer does is documented. Everything they do is documented. Every contact they have, every interaction they have, everything that they do in the course of that day is documented. So essentially they've got 10 months, 11 months depending, to demonstrate to us that they are capable in becoming a Chico police officer. So that is an ongoing uh, process. They ha then have another year's worth of time that they have to continue to prove that through probation, um, which they can be let go at any time for anything. And those evaluations are done again continuously and really continuously throughout their career. Um, it is an ongoing process. It's not just something we come in and, and do for eight hours. It's something we do continuously for the rest of their career. Thank you, sir. I think she has one over there. Benson, I'm on the police practices uh, uh, project of the ACLU. I've been involved in this for over 10 years, chairing the uh, uh, committee for the last five. But what I envision for this group, if, oh, there you go. Okay. And what I envision for this group is a board with chair and committees, and each chair would have issues to research. The issues I would recommend are use of force uh, policy, the for use of force policy the body cam policy, 
the review of the police complaint form and process. Racism in the Chico Police Department. Uh, review of data collected and see what else needs to be collected. Um, also, I recommend that you all sign up for the uh, Citizens Police Academy. It's excellent. Ed Nelson directs it, and you should sign up as soon as possible because it fills up. And uh, thank you. That's it. Um, Chief O'Brien, I am curious about a little over a year ago, you were presented with an idea, and, and this video brought it up again to me the, that we're, the community is afraid of your officers. And you were very surprised that I said that. Um, you were also very resistant to the idea that we have some type of oversight, anonymous, uh, third party, unbiased third party complaint system where people can safely make a complaint without fear of retaliation. Um, Margaret talked about how, f how rare police violence is in reality, but when you get onto the streets and you talk to people, it's a lot more common than the numbers would show. And so I w am asking you now, again, are you willing to, as part of this whole thing, um, work with an unbiased third party uh, for anonymous reporting of complaints against your officers? This is going to be the last one for the chief. We're going to bring it back to the CC for Jay. Yes. So that is a very good question. I want to also, again, explain how that process works. And Benson, you made a couple points I also want to uh, address just real quick. Um, all of our policies, body-worn camera policy, um, our use of force policy, every one of our policies is available for you to review. We completely allow that to, uh, to be um, reviewed by the public. We do not hide that. That is there for your perusal and your review. As far as the complaint process, I want to make sure that you understand that anyone can make a complaint, anonymous complaint, whatever. And we do investigate, but it's hard to investigate an anonymous complaint. I said I, I, I did not say I was against that. I was saying that it's hard to investigate an anonymous complaint. If we can go back and talk to the complainant and ask them what is going on, it's pretty tough to do a thorough investigation. And we do do thorough investigations. And the other thing I do want to add, you, you mentioned that use of force is actually rare. Let me just share how rare it is in Chico. And when we're talking also about transparency, since I became chief in 2015, I have released our use of force statistics every single year. Those use of force statistics include race, gender, the type of use uh, of force, the... Uh, drug or alcohol um, abuse um, that may be um, part of that particular uh, incident. And in 2017 alone, we had 77,622 contacts with the public. This is just an officer in the field having contact with someone. You know how many use of force incidents we had out of those 77,622 contacts? 62. That works out to 0.08 percent of the time just so you guys know to provide some context but you guys I can leave this with the concerned citizens for justice all our use of force event um, statistics I will leave that with you to look at and you can access that anytime thank you sir I got one right here I'm gonna hold the mic yeah I'm Paul West Becker I'm with the habeas clubs um, and I'm the intentional interim director of habeas clubs which started at Folsom prison um, over police brutality. Um, I love Chico. I think of it as like my garden. I think that we need to uh, start at the bottom and work our way up at the root level, and that's where we're at here today, hopefully. Um, and, and Serpico, uh, uh, Pacino uh, uh, was talking, a girl was talking to him over the fence in the backyard, and, and he told her, he said, if you love a man's garden, you gotta love the man. And uh, who else? Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in numerous instances, uh, it, uh, things have fallen apart um, because there wasn't enough uh, uh, groundwork, there wasn't enough foundation. So we do need to build a coalition here today, and it needs to be strong, and we need to share our email contacts with each other, and we need to start talking to each other individually and privately. 
I've had a horrendous experience with the police department and the district attorney and the judges. Uh, West Becker versus Landacre cost you guys over $700,000. I took it all the way through the Ninth Circuit and it was because a cop decided to break my arm um, in the year 2000. Um, you know, uh, police brutality starts with just the way that they harass somebody because they, they find a pillow under a bridge. Uh, police brutality starts with uh, not investigating a crime presented to them by a homeless person. Uh, police brutality uh, uh, begins with ignorance of, uh, of what's right and wrong uh, constitutionally, I mean legally. Uh, the police officers here, uh, in my opinion, have taken the law into their own hands. Uh, they've uh, ruined people's backs, their arms, their wrists. Okay, uh, that's two minutes. Okay, Thank that's you. Two minutes. Hey, I just we have a question over here. That was just a complaint. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you. In the first video, uh, Chief of Police said that police officers are t taught, trained to um, interact, to deal with citizens, not the other way around. And I just wonder if your group encounter any seminars or any community outreach where citizens are also informed on how to interact with the police, how to address them. Um, so that way it will be a two-way street and. Uh, we can all meet in the middle when possible. Do you know of any groups that have done that? It seems like you did a lot of research. I just didn't know if you encounter that type of uh, training. Are you asking me? Uh, the group, Emily, you, or uh, Diane? Okay. So we share. Okay. We share your experience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, there's a lot we could do down the road. Hold that thought, and maybe you could organize it for us. Yeah. Yes, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> okay. That's what we're talking about. I think no, I'm over here. Thank you, Vince. Um, I want to stand up so I can see everybody. My name is Mercedes, and I want to share a story that I heard with you. Unfortunately, this will be anonymous because the person wants to be protected. Um, I've known a person who graduated from uh, the Marine Corps and then went to Butte College, went to the academy, was accepted as a police officer here in Chico last year. And that person likes human beings, likes to interact, likes to talk, likes to see people as people. And uh, unfortunately, that individual is no longer with the Chico Police Department because he was ganged up on by senior officers and told, if you want to talk, be a social worker. If you want to work, be a cop. Um, now, I want to make... Uh, the differentiation here, a CIT trained officer, peace officer, is a social worker. They're also a civil servant. And it's our responsibility as the constituents of that service to stand up and get involved. I grew up in a police uh, family, in a law enforcement family. My mother was a dispatcher for the California Higher Patrol, and I was raised to trust and respect law enforcement. I had a great relationship growing up. I had no problems. Why? Because I had my mom in my back corner. As I grew up, my mom retired. Um, then my family moved on. My experiences changed. And I called the police less and less because I thought, I'm listening to my friends, the people of my generation that aren't voting. Why? Because we believe that people aren't listening to us, that the, po uh, the police will not serve us. They will not protect us. My question is, who are they protecting and serving? Who is approving these huge salaries if they're not going to work for the constituents? So with that said, um, it's up to us as engaged citizenry to be the eyes and ears of the officers. No matter how many officers we have, we're never going to have enough. It's our responsibility to call to report so that statistics can be accurate instead of saying, what's the point, why bother? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Oh. Yes. I don't think I'll take two minutes. Um, Lisa mentioned uh, wanting to bring CIT training. I think that responds somewhat to what you were talking about, Paula, of wanting to involve 50 
community members to to go through this in-depth police um, CIT training with the Memphis model, which we saw from the, the video how powerful that can be if it's done well. So it seems like that's the kind of thing we look toward and looking forward to, to learning more for all of us. Okay, thank you. And I just want to say, as a part of CC4J, we will be continuing to hold community conversations like this, probably quarterly. We haven't got to it, but there will, there will be more. Any Thank you. Questions? So my name is Angela Risden, and um, I really applaud what this group is trying to do. I'd like to be a part of it, uh, but my have a really big concern, and I understand the need to go slow and make sure that we've got everything in place, but my big concern is going too slow. I, I think there's a real need out there for this to happen as soon as we can get it up and running. I, too, have been subject to police and civility in this community as well. Um, so what can we do? Have you, when your research, have we looked for areas where maybe there's a template that we can use from another city, another organization, so we don't have to really start from scratch, that we can maybe, you know, start this going a little bit sooner than later? Um, how to start? Uh, yeah, thank you, Angela's my friend and uh, plays a, a, a big role in our community with the Unitarians. So thank you for being here, Angela. Um, I lost the point of your... I'm trying to fast track this. Okay, uh, when we came together, CC for J, we came together, we were just pulled together like magnets and we were concerned about the shootings in our community and we wanted to find ways to deal with that. Um, we put our heads down. It took us a year to even distill down what we wanted to change, what we wanted to develop. That's our focus points. We'd like to move faster too. And about models for uh, oversight, there are numerous models, but our um, guide will be NACOL, uh, because they are there to help us put this in place. But all around California, we have citizen oversight, though it varies in effectiveness. So when we get another solid group, we're going to have to begin to analyze what will work for Butte County or for the city of Chico. We don't know yet. And Thank you. I'd like to add to what Margaret said, and I really appreciate your question and your sense of urgency. Um, because we want changes more and more to be in place so that on all levels, not just loss of life, but also the indignities that happen when people are mistreated and abused. Um, so one of the things we're talking about, we know that to establish a citizen oversight committee or whatever we call it, whatever form it's in, is going to take a long time. And one of the things that I'm, I'm going to be winding this up with a closing and uh, we're looking also at interim steps we can take. Um, you know, this, we can't snap our fingers and make the changes, but already there are changes. And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll wind it up in just a minute, but. but <laughs> Your two minutes are up. I, I'm gonna finish my thought if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, I'm going to pass this to Jill next. But looking at interim steps and how we can get some safety in place before years from now, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, today, tomorrow, and next week, we have to start making those changes. So, um, okay, so Jill and then, oh. Con William. Congratulations to the group and to all of our uh, serving uh, public officials that's here with us. And it's a nice group. We, we used up all the chairs we had in a closet. Uh, you can help us put them away in a few minutes. Uh, but there's 80-something thousand people in Butte County not in this room. But what we do have is BCAC TV, and they have a channel on YouTube and you can look for that and see it again, and you can see it, and you can forward it, the link to your friends. But I would hope that the group uh, that you guys put together will include the media, 
because even if you have a group of concerned citizens, there is a digital world out there that can overwhelm you with negative information, fake news, and fake publicity, and you need to have a presence in the digital world to sustain some kind of synergy, not just nice people getting in a room, but websites and other social media and everything so you can reach a lot more people. Otherwise, the bad news always overwhelms the good. It always overwhelms unless you get ahead of it. Thank you. <laughs> Jill. And I just wanted to add, Angela, you mentioned going quickly. The more like-minded people that we have that are interested and want to start working with us towards citizen oversight, the faster we can get the work done. Because what 10 people can do in six months, 20 people can do in three months or less. So the more people we have that can help us, it's um, tedious work, it's a lot of work. We have all worked very hard. So. Um, that's my advice to you as well. I got one right here. You know the rules. <laughs> Be nice. Come in. Yeah, I wanted to ask Mike and Chief O'Brien, Mike Ramsey. Um, I'm not trying to blame everything on the cops or anything, you know, because the nurses and everybody else that our colleges teach, the teachers. I have four generations of my family school teachers here. Not one of them will say a word about the illegal ag spray. We've been sprayed out there. They changed the law to where 25 feet away, they can spray the creek. Now, that's the kind of mentality that it takes for a Chico state to have the chief of police, the commission, the, um, what, the, you know, the money people, all exploiting Rape Alley. You got a camera on Rape Alley. The college had money. Mike, you had money. You bought the air monitor. Where's public safety come first? Okay. Does he want to give him a chance to answer that? <laughs> or no? No. He don't no. want to answer. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> We're going to move forward. Okay, we got one right here. Right. Thank you. Uh, my name is James. Um, I actually had an opportunity. I was in politics in Oregon, and uh, I was chairman of a local public safety coordinating council for several years, and we had all the criminal justice players, um, state, county, city, um, elected officials. We had mental health. We had public health. And we were actually required by the state legislature to, to work to coordinate uh, a lot of the activities. Um, and so I think we should look at that model, which um, could help Butte County, it could bring the city and county together, because you know the county's run by the sheriff. Sheriff's elected, he's an autonomous individual who makes decisions. In the city, you have the city manager who's going to choose the police chief. And so overseeing the city manager is the council. So if you get a citizen oversight committee, is it going to be appointed by citizens? Is it going to be appointed by government? You've got to work some of those things out. But we're not doing structurally what we could do right now because if we have mental health and public health setting at the table with our law enforcement, our structural. So we have some structural issues that could be addressed. One of the biggest factors I think you'll see in research is you need investigators in the district attorney's office that have a little bit of autonomy. And, you know, it's easy to tell the district attorney to do that. It's another thing to give them the budget to do it. But we're supposed to have separation of powers. That is blended. We no longer have that. You know, talk to the district attorney, talk to police, talk to, you're talking to the same structure because you haven't set up the separation of powers to work like it could. You could look at the fact of how many people go to trial versus how many people plea bargain now. You can see that. There's a huge change going on in that area. So there's some structural issues. Performance-based budgeting, where the citizens actually decide how to spend the budget, and specifically through surveys to the county, where you look at a serious crime survey. So you actually Time's put up. the expenditures of budget. But I'll finish up, but one more. 
We need to get rid of the police officer off the car and put peace officer. We'll see you at the next meeting. When we do establish um, citizen oversight, we will also have to decide what its parameters are. In some areas, citizen oversight has made really very important statements on how the police will manage homelessness and um, how they will manage immigration. So we'll have to decide what role we want our group to play and how wide of a role. Okay, I have one right here. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. It's a quick question, she said, so I'm going to hold the mic because it's quick. Okay. I just was wondering if the committee has thought about how to avoid becoming another police advisory board. Um, just have you have you discussed how to avoid that? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, constantly. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. We we are very proud to have a police advisory board, and however, the police advisory board in Chico does not accept complaints from the public. It does not collect evidence of police misconduct. It does not interview witnesses or make findings or recommendations. It does not adjudicate any situation. It is not a fact-finding authority. And we do not know or have an idea of the training the members receive. I told you. Okay, uh, it's on Deborah there. Okay. Um, Congratulations also. Oh, thank you. Deborah Lucero, um, elect, Supervisor District 2. Woo! Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. All right, thank you. I just wanted to bring up that on a tour that uh, Mike Ramsey's office was so gracious to give me, um, I was told that 50 people were arrested 500 times, the same 50 people 500 times in 2017. And about 80% of those people were either homeless, most likely addicted, and possibly mentally ill. So unless we have this police oversight committee really on the same rail as we are working on mental health issues, um, I don't believe we will be successful. So, um, you know, we need to think more regionally. It, the city of Chico, the county must collaborate together. We have to. And, and I would like to see counties collaborating beyond our borders. I would like to see crisis intake centers every 90 minutes mm -hmm. from Wairica, Redding, and Chico, where we have homeless populations, and in between detox centers. And I'm talking big money. I would like to get big money, which I think we could get, if we were regionally organized. Um, we are not. And one city is not going to cut it, and one county is not going to cut it, north of Sacramento. We have to regionalize to solve some of these issues. They are bigger than we are, and they are bigger than we have the money for. So I'm just encouraging everybody, when we think of this, that we need to be thinking about mental health, and we need to be thinking about where are we going to put people, and how are we going to help them. So um, one guy told me he recently got off the street. The reason he did is he qualified for um, native health uh, benefits, and he was able to go in to a day center. And he said, I said, why did you want to stop being on the streets? And he said, I just got tired of waking up at 2 in the morning and looking at the stars and just waiting for the store to open so I could go buy some alcohol. And he got the help he needed, and he's off the street. Yes. Thank you. I got one over here. Well, I and this is I'm not going to ask Chief O'Brien, but um, <laughs> is there any has there ever has there is there a mandate that says the police department has to do this, has to accommodate? Is there some mandate that I didn't hear about? No. Okay. Well, then I'd really like to thank them for being here, because because this. This is a powerful group. I know the people that are, that are involved in this. And um, 
and I, now I'm getting to know other people, and they're not going to let go. So, <laughs> yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-oh. Hi, um, my name is Walter Horvath. Um, my question's regarding the body cams because it's great we have body cams, but if they're used selectively, they're useless. And we just had we 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 just had an incident month two months ago where there was a claim that we couldn't get body cam footage because it happened so fast, and that doesn't make any sense to me because body cam should have a thirty second to two minute buffer that records to a memory, you turn it on and it stores. I want to know, like, I feel if they're on the duty, they're, if they're on the clock, they're out of the car and they're off the pot, that camera should be on. Yeah. So I want to know why it wasn't even on in the first place. Yeah. And that is the kind of issue that a citizen oversight will deal with. There she goes. She's right there. So that wasn't a Chico Police Department um, incident, just... Just, just to let you know, but um, our policy, again, you can go, uh, go online, look at our policy. Any time a police officer has, one of our police officers has contact with a citizen, they're to have those, uh, those body cameras on. There are a few exceptions if you're dealing with a very sensitive victim, something like that. There are some exceptions, but general, if you're in some kind of enforcement contact, that kind of uh, activity, those cameras are by policy to be on. Our policies do have a buffer that go back, I believe, at least 30 seconds. I'll have to go back and confirm that. So as soon as you activate that camera, um, it does go back at least 30 seconds, if not a little longer, to capture that incident preceding that camera being turned on, just so you guys are aware. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Deborah, you just mentioned a success story, which is wonderful, about a person who found a way to to shelter. Um, my name's Patrick Newman. Um, so the problem though, if you talk to Ed Mayer or somebody who's familiar with housing issues, we're about 2,000 units short of affordable housing in Butte County. I believe that will continue for some time to come and it could even get worse. So the default here is that we've got many people living in our public spaces. Um, we call them homeless people, but they're really just people who occupy the public space. And I just, this may be an aside to everything we're talking about here, but some of what, some of the problem that we have here is that we've locked in, um, not, not a guaranteed success, but a guaranteed failure by the way we've structured our laws. So um, if we have laws against public urination and defecation, and then we lock our restrooms eight hours of every day, um, we set up a situation where uh, a peace officer um, is, is, is in an impossible situation because they're trying to enforce an insane law, or enforce a reasonable law in an insane situation. Um, <clears throat> this permeates the entire relationship between people on the streets and the police department. Because if you look at every single law that we have in our books, you see that it's almost impossible to be homeless without breaking those laws. So we've criminalized homelessness in Chico. Um, I think this is gonna be a fundamental problem going forward. We need to find our way to coexistence this war, this conflict that's going on between our community and people on the streets, um, it really needs to end. And uh, so I hope that's part of the fabric of what you people are thinking about because a lot of police hours go into this crazy way of trying to manage this emergency situation, which is really just economic refugees in the public space for the most part. Thank you very much for your work. I appreciate all your presentations, beautiful. Hi, my name's Ruth, and a lot of what Deborah said is is what I wanted to say. Um, but I was looking at the way this gentleman here was talking about his committee, and how there were representatives from different parts of the community that had ownership of this. And so I was visualizing someone from downtown, someone from Butte County Sheriff, someone from. The police, it seems like there should be a representative for all the different parts of our community because the police, our, our police. And so I was just wanting to share that vision with you. 
I just want to say that's a vision that we had in our many meetings that that came up. And we have reached out to a number of people that are not here tonight, as well as the people that, that are here. Can everyone hear me okay? So I, we do hear what you're saying, um, but there are some people that chose not to attend as well. One more for this gentleman with the great idea. So if you look at the Oregon model, it's called a local public safety coordinating council, and every county has one. And so it forces all the players, public health, mental health, it's already set up. You have elected officials, you have a whole group set down, it's professionally structured, and it was very effective. And I put the whole group on performance-based budgeting. Performance-based budgeting, you go out, you surveys, you check with your citizens to find out what their priorities are, including law enforcement, and then when you do that budget, I used to do the county budget. You make sure that county budget matches your citizen, you know, your citizen viewpoints. Um, so there is already a group going that this group could work with. It'd be a transition. It's already been accepted as kind of a citizen's group a little bit, and that's called Team Chico. Um, I think we can give some accolades to the Chico Police Department because I know they've worked with Team Chico. I think we've seen a lot of improvements um, in our community already as a result of that work. So it is a transitional group that this group should touch bases with because they've been able to already get into the different layers of the structure and I think it's a pretty positive message. But Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, my name is Robert Mullins. I'm one of the local uh, native Maidu, Maidum in my language. Uh, my grandfathers were the chiefs up here in these mountains and along uh, the other ridge of Feather Falls. So that's who I am at this time. Recognized Department of Corrections as a NASL, Native American spiritual leader. So by noting that, uh, don't call me a liar, okay? I don't want to be an Indian liar. I just want to bring up the point. This hat says U.S. Abraham Lincoln, CVN, that's carrier vessel nuclear. I worked on uh, defense contracts for almost 40 years, and uh, I was a single dad commuting every day to the Bay Area. One day in the park, I got a weekend off, I took my kids there, and this police officer looks at me and my children and does one of these. Well, now he's wearing four stars. The climate is not going to change with the police department. What needs to be held with the community here is they need to be strong-minded, not come to meetings and giggle and laugh. We need to be strong and have contingents to respond where police respond, okay? When you file complaints against the police, they have people in there to make things go away. I brought up an issue of uh, the United States Constitution to a police officer, and guess what he does? I've had enough of you. He smashes my head on top of the squad car, handcuffs me, my wrists are bleeding, and I'm in a 110-degree locked uh, police car until the supervisor shows up, sees what's going on. Well, that officer was Rupel. He's no longer, in the, he's not the one that smashed my face. He's the one that opened the windows, okay? The climate is not going to change. Contingents of people need to respond to witness how the police are dealing with the citizens. That's all I have to say. It has to be strong. Yes. <clears throat> my name is Richard Roth. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, has got me is uh, looking at, at our ballot uh, and the number of positions that go uncontested. And to me, an uncontested position is one that is in malaise. Um, and so um, that's my choice. I did not vote for any of the uncontested uh, positions. But I think it's uh, a responsibility of the public, of us, to see that these elected positions are hotly contested so that we do have a voice. Uh, um, uh, one of the things um, that was mentioned was the training uh, that uh, officers get. I was wondering whether th those trainings would be open to uh, attendance by folks from the oversight committees uh, or the public. 
Uh, and if not, whether or not even something like BCT TV could be present to uh, record those so that people can see how our officers are being trained. Um, I was, uh, my first job away from home was in a hospital in Topeka, Kansas, uh, on a half medical, half psychiatric unit. And it was probably at the peak of the mental health treatment phase, but it was right before, um, uh, after One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and the movie, the book and the movie. And since then, we've seen a great uh, decrease in the amount of treatment uh, and the options available for treating mental health folks. Uh, and it, it saddens me to see that uh, m the treatment that seems most obvious in our community is a bullet. And so I, I agree, we need something that's very uh, strong, or a strong response to that. Thank you. I think this is gonna be the last uh, questions or comments, and then I'm um, going to turn it over to Emily. I hate to be that one. Um, <laughs> I wanted to agree with the lady behind me and the gentleman who took his hat off a moment ago, um, and the strong response that I'm hoping to see is from people like me who just live in my house in a downtown neighborhood. I live alone, and I would welcome a little more public education. I have to ask my neighbors, you know, do you call 911 for that? Because I'm new here. Or do you, when do you, you know, is, when do you do that? Um, some of what we saw in those videos was frightening. Uh, how do I respond when I'm pulled over for my seatbelt? <laughs> um, and how do I call 911 if I'm fearful? So I would welcome that kind of training. Um, when my kids were in public schools, they learned to stop, drop, and roll if their clothes were on fire. And that's something that they were taught so often that maybe under stress, when you're not thinking, unlike my feminist consciousness raising back in the day, it would come back to me in a moment of stress if it's that simple. So um, I would encourage more house-to-house -house involvement of renters and owners of houses. I'm going to end it with this. I'm going to say just as an African-American male that's lived here since 1992, what I have kids, and they grew up here, and it's kind of a shame that you have to tell your children how to respond to police officers. And it's probably totally different than how white people have to teach their kids how to respond. Yes. With us, it's just put your hands up out first. Don't make any sudden moves. And that's, to me, that's not right. That's how we have to teach our children. So, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily right now. Thank you. That was a really important final comment. You know, it, it is really a shame that the color of our skin colors the way we're treated so often by law enforcement. I, when I was a hippie, <laughs> maybe I still am. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a younger hippie living in a commune, that was decades ago, I, um, my, my child was almost trampled when the police barged into my, uh, my house and I was, I was handled and treated very disrespectfully. Now that I'm a little bit more cleaned up and very white, I'm always treated with respect. I've never had police officers treat me with anything but respect, and I appreciate that. Uh, however, just because I'm not a young black man, <laughs> that young black man should also be treated with respect. Even, even if someone is breaking the law, we, we, there's a distinction between breaking the law and still being treated with respect. We're all human beings. And um, that's, that's the kind of cultural change we're looking for. So this has been a wonderful conversation, a very rich conversation. I, I was just taking notes as fast as I could uh, to capture as much of people's thoughts and passions as we can. And three of us are, were taking notes so that we don't leave anything of this behind. 
We are going to wind up soon, and uh, we schedule till 8.30. You're welcome to stick around. Um, but I do want, uh, I, I have a few things I want to be sure that I say, so I'm going to look at my notes here. Um, one of the things is it has not been comprehensive. This is huge, and I share the eagerness to make things happen as fast as we can. So there's a couple of levels. One is that long-term goal of, of uh, established citizen oversight policy, and the other is getting interim things, behaviors, practices, I attitudes in place uh, as quickly as we can. And um, the, these changes must include not only law enforcement personnel, but also all first responders, mental health professionals, those who serve the public in many capacities, and all of us community members. And a lot of that has been said. I was pleased how much was talked about with mental health because that's an area we haven't gone into deeply in our group, but it's, it's crucial that, that mental health professionals be trained in the same kind of compassionate um, human responses to needs as law enforcement and for all first responders. Um, our goals for this evening's gathering included building a broad base of support in our community and inspiring others, you, and you folks watching on TV, to work with us. Please consider if and how you would like to help make this vision become a reality in our community. We are a small group, CC4J, of dedicated people, and we need to increase our numbers if we are to be successful. Some of the tasks that we see ahead are to learn very specifically about local law enforcement procedures to better understand what is going well and what needs improvement. That's going to take uh, Mike Benson. You suggested some committees. I think that was a I great think idea. Was too tight, but okay. <laughs> um, so that's that's one committee's work um, to research forms of odor, uh, of citizen oversight. We've done a lot of reading, but we have to figure it out. What would what would be best for for our region? And I like Deborah talking about regional approach. But we may have to start with Chico and Butte County because that's where we are. And if there's folks from Paradise and Oroville uh, who want to get things going too, yeah, let's work with as many people as we can. But that's kind of the interim solutions. We can look at the big picture and then take the steps we can take. Um, we need to learn about the practices of local first responders and men mental health professionals that impact vulnerable populations such as those with mental illness, substance addiction, or folks who are homeless, and what changes are needed to better serve all in our community with dignity and respect. I'm saying things that have already been said this evening, but it's kind of nice to wind it up. We need to consider interim steps as we as a community, law enforcement, and other professionals can take to begin the process of changing our culture as we work toward the long-term goal of citizen oversight. We'd like to gather stories of people's personal experiences with law enforcement and other first responders, positive and negative, by video, audio, written, um, with confidentiality respected, to help gain a perspective of what is needed going forward from people's personal experiences. And the last thing we need is not so procedural. We need a website. And our little group isn't so good at cr making that happen. So if there's somebody who, who wants to build us a website, we would so I appreciate that. All right. Oh, Thank you. Done. Check that one off. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, as you came in, there are sign-up sheets. There are four clipboards with sign-up sheets. And um, there's a space not only for your name and contact information, but also if you'd like to s keep posted on what we're doing, or even better, if you'd like to help. There's a place for you to put comments about how you'd like to help, or um, you know, just thoughts, any kind of comments. So we'd love for you to take the time 
we're finishing up way before 8.30, and um, that's fine to take the time to fill out those, those um, sign-up sheets. I call them sign-up instead of sign-in. We know there's about 85 people here, but the people who are going to be with us going forward are the ones I'm most interested in tonight, although I welcome everyone who's here. Please print legibly on those sign-up sheets. I have lost so many people over the years of sign-up sheets when I can't read the email address or the phone number. So all please print legibly, all, uh, all capital letters, good idea, and printed capital letters. Okay, I think that's it. We are thinking, uh, yes, Paula. Do people feel like they'd like to spend some time that way, or else we can do it informally? Yes? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I just want to say one more thing, and then that'll be done with my little list of things to say, is that we are looking at having another community conversation in September, and hopefully we'll have a lot of progress to report on by then, mm -hmm. and more of us. <laughs> okay, so um, do you want to take this back over yeah, for yeah. to give some elected officials? Which elected official? We're not one. We a point. Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. All right, Paula. Right. 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 That, that's yeah. Would you like? Okay, Mike Ramsey, uh, Buchanan District Attorney. A couple of uh, things, uh, particularly for the committee, uh, and we thank the committee. Uh, back the initial contact with the committee back, I think it was in March, at the Human Relations Network. And we indicated that you were kind of going off on a, a rail that wouldn't get you any sort of cooperation from the law enforcement community. And I'm very glad to see that in that communication uh, that bore fruit in the sense of looking at the, the concepts that you are looking at. A couple of things, as Benson has mentioned and the ACLU has mentioned uh, a couple of times, is educating yourselves on police procedure, and that's the Chico Citizens Academy. Uh, other resources are the, uh, the CCP, which is the Community Corrections Partnership, which meets every other month, and that consists of criminal justice partners that are doling out, as it were, money for rehabilitation. And that's their main focus, is looking at rehabilitation. That's probation, public defender, uh, mental health, uh, uh, Department of Employment, Social Services, Welfare Department, uh, as well as the, the police agencies making sure that we can try and see and prevent crime from continuing, particularly for those that have that uh, uh, unfortunate bend at times. Uh, the jail, very big, and their day reporting center. And I would say that you should see and uh, get a tour of uh, Buchanan's County's very progressive jail uh, day reporting center in which people with that have run across the criminal justice system are involved in all sorts of resources. And I hear the bell ringing. <laughs>
So I too appreciate the uh, committee. Um, you know, these are tough conversations. Um, none of these are easy. There's a lot of uh, difficult things that have to get out on the table and really get discussed. So I've never been one to shy away from that. I welcome those conversations. Even if you disagree with me, and that's okay, I am least willing to have that conversation with you at any time, any place, and I think the uh, committee can attest at least to that. The one thing I wanted to uh, also commend the committee, you referenced six uh, pillars, really six uh, points that you wanted to emphasize. They all come from the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, put together by um, President Obama. Um, those pillars, um, I was uh, able to go back to the White House, well, one of the uh, buildings on the White House grounds, and actually hear about these, uh, these principles firsthand. And, and they're all very, very sound, and I agree with them in principle. I just wanted to say that as your chief of police. I think there's a lot of positive ground, a lot of common agreement that we can find actually here tonight. I wanted to let the committee know that. Wow. <laughs> Isn't this the city manager's assistant? Assistant city manager. Right, 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 right. Don't you? Yeah, yeah, you're trying to hide. He's putting his head down. Talk to the people. All I would say is I'm not here in an official capacity. I'm one who likes to participate in my community just like everybody was here. Okay. Okay, Randall Stone first. How you doing, Randall? Thank you, uh, Randall Stone. I'm a member of the Chico City Council. Uh, and I, I appreciate this meeting here and recognize that the way that we really get great change done is because groups like this. Um, and I mention that because uh, we have an opportunity this fall, and I'm not gonna sell politics uh, tonight, but we have an opportunity this fall to make changes um, in our vision. And there are several of us that are supportive of, of a community-oriented uh, policing model, as well as the, the community oversight group. I'm one of them. Um, and I'm supporting people that I, I appreciate um, are behind that action. I hope they're gonna win in November. I won't even mention their names. But as you see people in these meetings, and I'm not talking about me, um, it's my job to be here. Let's, let's just be honest about it. I'm not here um, because I, I think this is the, the wonderful idea, though I do. I'm here because I'm an elected council member, and I'm here to listen, which is why you didn't hear me posing uh, comments and questions. I appreciate our assistant city manager being here as well for, for um, not those same reasons. But there are people that are involved in this community and are, are listening to you and coming to these meetings and engaging in many different levels. Pay attention to that, because those are the people that you should be supporting in November. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for the community, uh, uh, I keep screwing up the name, I, I want to call it Community Justice Court, but that's something oversight entirely different. The Oversight Committee. Um, and I think we can get this done, and, and I think the, the model that we have now has been problematic because there aren't opportunities to engage. I appreciate the Chief and uh, uh, the Police Advisory Board, but what it doesn't do is exactly what we need as a community. And, and I wanted that change four years ago. We didn't have the votes at that time, maybe even close to five years ago. And I think we can this fall. So pay attention to the people that are at your meetings and engaging with you. I, I don't need to tell you who they are. You know who they are. Thank you. Well, with that said, I think it's appropriate to get this gentleman the mic. <laughs> oh. oh, thank you, Vince. Um, so it seems like we have a very uh, open and approachable chief of police in town. I know, I know I've had the opportunity to meet with him a couple of times and he seems like a very open-minded official. Um, what I'm wondering is, it sounds like we actually have 
this group already has a lot of things in common with the chief's philosophy. It sounds like we're close to being somewhere where we can sort of put a draft together that everybody can agree on to try to move forward. I don't want to speak on anybody's behalf, but wouldn't that be the best starting point to sort of lay out what all the things that we have in agreement are and then try to move that forward? And who are you? My name is Scott Huber. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, elected officials, and. Okay. Well, I'm going to hand it back over to Emily. If that's it. Okay. We still have time. You running? Um, my name's Evan. I planned the walkout at my school. I've talked to the chief of police a couple of times. Um, I would love to be involved with this uh, as I was told by the chief of police that there are going to be armed police officers at our schools in the fall. Um, that's something that personally scares me a lot. I don't go to high school anymore. I have since graduated but that's something that I feel citizens should have an oversight on. Also, I came kind of late to the meeting. I don't know if anyone's acknowledged that we're on occupied Machupta land, but that is something very important that needs to happen, and I think that you guys need a member of the Machupta tribe on your board thing. Um, that's all. Yay, fun times. Thank you. Uh, Chief O'Brien, Mike Ramsey. I wanted to address what Benson brought up, what you mentioned, uh, Mr. Ramsey, about the Citizens Police Academy. That is a program that I had the opportunity, I was accepted into the program last year, and unfortunately I was only able to complete the first half of the program, but let me tell you this. It accepts 40 people per year. That's not enough to train everybody and to empower our community in the mutual ways that are required for true democracy. It's a commendable effort. Let me tell you this as well, in full transparency. Most of the slides, most of the uh, presentations that were given dated back some 20 years, not relevant to our community. Additionally, the people who were there were people who had the time to attend those meetings because they were placed at a time where most people are home taking care of their kids, most people are doing night school or, or the things. And when I say most people, I'm talking about my people. I'm talking about the people that aren't making $100,000 a year and are able to attend whatever they want to at any time. I'm not saying they're not hardworking people. Everybody, I'm sure that, that most people would consider themselves in that category. Just wanted to share that with you, that that although it's a worthy, prog uh, worthy program that's checking off, okay, that we're doing this, but are we really doing this as a community? Is that need really being met by that program? I say no. Okay. Well, all right. Oh, the lady in the blue. So I, I am also very encouraged to see the number of people here and the concerns that are being expressed. And I don't really want to leave tonight not knowing that there is a commitment from the police department to work with the citizens, um, concerned citizens for, for uh, justice. Because although people might sign up, they've been working hard for a year, and as the rest of us try to get on board to provide additional assistance, I want to know that it's going someplace. I really appreciate you being here, but I would like to see some kind of commitment about what, how this is going to progress and how the department is going to be incorporating um, the participation of the citizens that do have a concern. So I think my commitment to have these conversations, that has not only been um, evidence tonight, but really in my conversations with the group that preceded this meeting. That's really where the hard work happens, and I've already been part of that, that process, and I think I've demonstrated that commitment. I, if I need to say that publicly again, of course. Of course I'm committed to those, uh, those hard conversations.
It's looking like we're winding down. I really want to encourage you. I, I just took a look at the um, sign-up sheets, and the first columns are full of your email addresses and your phone numbers and your names. And that, that, com that column to the far right where it asks what you'd like to do to help, um, most of them are empty. So, <laughs> But you, you signed in coming in, and you didn't know. You know, I didn't expect people to come in knowing what, they, what direction they wanted to take. We hope we inspired you tonight to join us. I'm inspired to hear such forceful, visionary comments. It's really thrilling to me. Many of you I've seen before. I've interacted with you, and many I haven't. But it feels like we're underway, and that's... It's exciting to me, Real, really exciting. So let's close it up, but take your time. There's lots of juice and, uh, I mean, tea and water and, and um, columns that need to be filled out. <laughs> <laughs> and they're shutting me down. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> no, that was okay. That's good. <laughs>